He's giving me the whole show. Maybe now, maybe a million. Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah, we did. So, we're waiting on this. No phone right for this. Random Study Commission to order. Uh, Mr. Harris, will you call the roll? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barber. Ms. Bird. Here. Ms. Cook. Present. Mr. Dastro. Here. Ms. Lyons. Here. Mr. Feldman. Here. Mr. Graham. Here. Ms. Rufo. Here. And Chairman Adams. Here. Do we have a quorum? We do. Okay. With a quorum, we are now in session. Uh, first order of business, as always, is approval of the minutes. Each of you received a copy of the minutes in the last week or two, I think. Um, are there any corrections or changes, suggestions for the minutes? For last month's meeting. Okay. Hearing, hearing none, uh, are there any objections to approving the minutes as written? No. Okay. So hearing no objections, the meetings are the minutes are approved. Uh, my report, um, not really anything to report. Uh, first, I just want to thank everybody who is here, who is not required to be here. Uh, for for whatever reason, it's great to see people in the audience. So uh, thank you, thank you for coming. I uh, just want to let you know the meeting is recorded. I don't think it's live streamed. It's being live streamed to uh, the Northeast Neighbors United Facebook page, and then a recording will be provided to the city. Okay, so we are, are currently live, so uh, just so everybody is aware of that. Uh, if you do not want to be recognized that this is, this is a public record. Uh, we, we will get to our public comments uh, and each of you have, have the opportunity to speak, to ask questions if you would like. Uh, when we do, and I will remind you of this at the time, just ask that you, I think we have a mic, we'll have a microphone somewhere. Yeah, right. Oh, there's a microphone right in front of me. Hopefully I can be heard. Uh, that we ask you to give your name and the street on which you live. Uh, other than that, I have, oh, the other item is, uh, I did receive a question about the, the time frame. Uh, so as, as we all know, and letting you know, we're, we're in the study phase. 
The first nine months of this is studying the concepts, studying how the city works, what other cities have done, uh, whether they've passed home rule, whether they've chosen not to, uh, all with the intent of a vote in January as to whether we should to uh, approve vote, approve drafting a new charter. So we are, we are not in the process of drafting a charter. This is strictly a, the study phase of, of the first nine months. So with that, uh, the question came up is, when would we be voting? And while it's not a set, it would be decided by the commission. My, my thought would be, uh, the plan is, for the next two months, is that we would meet again in December, first meeting in another quadrant. I think we are talking about the Northeast for the next meeting. I haven't yelled it down, but yes. Okay. So the December meeting, first Thursday of December, would be in the Northeast quadrant. And then the final outside of City Hall meeting first would be the first Thursday of January of next year. It's hard to believe that January of next year is already coming around. Uh, and that would probably, that would be in the Northwest. And I think we've been talking about West, West Arts. Yes. And if, if that's possible. Either way, it will be made public uh, plenty of time before. Um, those meetings are intended for, for finishing up, for continuing and finishing up the study. So my suggestion will be, and we can decide, we don't have to decide this right now, is that we would call a, a special meeting, I think before the 15th of January, that's our nine month deadline, uh, at which would be solely meant for deliberations and voting and deciding whether to go forward. Uh, so that would be sometime between the first Thursday of January and I think the date would be the 15th. Uh, so just something to keep in mind for now. We're not making, the, we don't need to make any decision right now, but in the next few weeks, uh, that, that actually should be one that we should probably nail down. And hopefully this actually puts up the next part uh, with Mr. Harris is that would be returning to City Hall. So we would need to find a date, a date and time that we could we would have access uh, to the city, city uh, resources. Okay. Absolutely. So our, our nine month deadline is nine months from when? Uh, I'm, my understanding and solicitor can probably uh, tell, for, tell us for sure, but my understanding was it's nine months from when the election was certified. So that uh -huh. puts us at uh, nine months from May 15th. I'm trying to Sir, the election certification. I, I don't remember what, what exact date Someday that was. in May. We were sworn in 10 days after it, I remember. Yeah, there, there was a, a deadline for, I, I think we actually were sworn in like three days after. We have to be sworn in within 10 days after the certification, if I remember. I think it was about three days. So we, 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 are, we have to make a decision before that, that window closes. Yes, we were sworn in on June 8th. On June? No, May. We were, we, were, we were sworn in on June 8th. Oh. I, I, believe, I believe that our deadline is somewhere in February, not oh, February. Oh, in February. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay, that may be. I, I need to, I need to, I, I, yeah, I need to check the dates, but I, I believe you're somewhere in February. Oh, okay, so um, my, my mistake. Great, that makes it actually a little bit easier. Go ahead, Jared. Well, well the, the thinking was, if the commission votes to not proceed with the charter, they will need time to draft the final report with reasons and recommendations. Right. And that would take mid-January, mid-February, right. and get it done. Uh, and if you decide to proceed with a charter, you pick up that you start, uh, the, your second phase starts when you make the vote. And your technical deadline is February, but what Jerry's pointing out is somewhere in February, I don't have yeah. a specific date. What Jerry is pointing out is that as a group, you should probably be making the determination a little bit earlier than that because if you are not going to proceed to draft the new charter, you do have a role in preparing a report that would require time and a vote uh, before that ultimate deadline. So the deadline, if you if you are moving forward with drafting a charter, that's all you need to do in at February. But if you were going to actually decide to not move forward, realistically, you need to make that decision earlier than the deadline so that you can complete the report by the deadline. 
So we're, so we're mid, back mid, to mid, meeting sometime in the middle of January to, right. to mid, actually mid, make the vote. Yeah, I would, I would say mid-January mid is the time frame I think PEL was, was thinking about when they laid out the proposals. Okay. Did you? And if we decide to move forward, we're not required to submit a report? It's only if Correct. If, you, if, you're, if you're moving forward, there's no report because ultimately your report is the new charter and a report that goes to the electorate um, okay. in the general election. Okay, so that will be the plan. Uh, we'll, we're shooting for a vote uh, sometime in January, but not. I think what I think what I'm trying to get, make the point is the first meeting, the meeting on the first Thursday of January is a regular Home Rule Study Commission meeting. Uh, we'll be meeting in the Northwest, and then we at sometime between now and then we will be scheduling a additional meeting in January that would be. For, uh, solely for deliberations and voting. Okay. Got it. So give me enough times I'll I'll get what I what I mean out. Is that going to be public? Absolutely. Public. Every meeting is public. Okay. Yep. okay. Uh, the next order of business uh, item on, on the agenda <laughs> is uh, PEL, the Pennsylvania e Economics League has a about a ten to fifteen minute presentation on what the, the whole process is, what home rule is, uh, and they're, gonna, they're making this at each of the four quadrant meetings. Uh, and then after that, we'll have the opportunity for anybody in the public to make comments or ask questions. Uh, so we're putting them first so that you can kind of get the same educational aspect that we begin. So, uh, Mr. Cross, if you want to proceed. Thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Gerald Cross. Uh, I'm with the Pennsylvania Economy League, obviously. Uh, we are a statewide 87 year old nonprofit, nonpartisan organization uh, with regional offices in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm with the Essential Division. With me tonight is Fred Reddick and Patty Moorhead from our, uh, our Central Division. We wanted to put together this brief presentation to give everyone an idea of what the Government Study Commission, uh, the, the voters had decided when they impaneled the Government Study Commission and what that means uh, going forward. So if the okay. thing works, we'll make it work. Hold on. There we go. Well, I have the wrong presentation, so I'm going to have to read from this. Okay, here we go. Uh, the duties of the Government Study Commission are defined by state law. There was a uh, 1968 constitutional convention where the legislators, I'm sorry, the, the conventioners decided that home rule would be an option for local governments in Pennsylvania. Home rule has a, uh, has a history uh, starting in the West Coast, uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, with uh, empowering local citizens in their local government. Uh, that's been making its way across the country. And by 1968, the Pennsylvania Con Constitution was amended to allow for home rule. Home rule was uh, passed by the legislature, I believe, in 1972. And uh, from that point, municipalities, the electors of the municipalities, had the option to petition their government for a home rule study, or the government itself can petition, uh, could petition, uh, could ask the uh, county to put a question on the ballot. The city of Lancaster, the council and the mayor did pursue that option. They put the, uh, they, they passed an ordinance requesting a valid question, which was approved, and uh, nine people uh, had the highest number of votes, and they were elected to be the Government Study Commission. So they have a job, and they have a job that's rather serious for the first phase, as you heard the chairman say, they were in the study phase. They have a duty to review, analyze, and evaluate the government structure not current, uh, not current office holders, not past office holders, uh, but actually to currently decide whether or not the local government structure is adequate and sufficient for delivery of services to citizens. Uh, we have that up there, not an inquisition on the current or past because it, it is a study of the government, the, the structure, the processes, the function of the government. And one of the ways you do that is you have to learn about government structure and operations. As a citizen a volunteer on the commission, uh, I dare say most of the people that ran for the commission had an understanding of local government from a citizen's point of view, but perhaps not from a, a technical 
uh, uh, even theoretical point of view of how the whole system actually works. So they have to learn about government structures. There are different structures in Pennsylvania from a borough, city, and township form and county. Learn how that kind of government delivers services. Learn the different governing structures. They would then interview local government officials of the city to determine the current operations, how those people's jobs inter intertwine with each other, the different, uh, different levels of uh, authority, who has executive power, who has legislative power, and frankly ask questions about the, uh, the way their job do is, is done so that they can learn whether or not there are strengths and weaknesses of the current structure. They have finished that. There are uh, interviews with the municipal officials. Uh, they're studying that part. Those are on the website. You can look at those if you like the answers that came back from the, the different officials so far. Uh, they are embarking on a study of other government's functions. Uh, tonight they'll hear about uh, assignments to look at other municipalities in Pennsylvania that are comparable to Lancaster or have structures that can inform the, the commission uh, whether or not uh, those different forms of government are more effective or efficient. Uh, evaluate the current government and then at the end, as you heard the chairman describe, they have a vote. There's really only one vote they take, and that vote is to decide whether or not they have learned that the current government is sufficient and effective, or whether or not, in their judgment, the current government can be made more efficient and effective by changing the form of government and codifying that in a charter, which would outline the rules and the responsibilities of that government. So when they did this kind of work, they reviewed the city code. Uh, there was a work plan developed very early on. I think it was in July. Um, the commission has been moving along. They reviewed the codes. A, a meeting and a couple of meetings was developed to uh, show municipal comparisons. They reviewed the current city code, which is, uh, interestingly enough, a charter. That is not a home rule charter. It's a legislative charter. Uh, it's an optional plan that voters in the city in the early 60s uh, formed a panel, not unlike this panel, to review the available charter government from the legislature and decide whether or not they can adopt that. That's called an optional plan A, and uh, it's maybe be called strong <coughs> mayor, strong, God bless you, strong mayor you. council uh, form of government. They would then compare the city code that Lancaster works from under now to those similar codes of cities, third class cities, second class cities, second class A cities, boroughs, both types of townships, and other home rule municipalities. They did the interview, the, uh, well the interview was done by, by paper, but we, with the, the uh, uh, when we're saying interview in Lancaster, it was, it was the uh, question I was just describing. And there's also other elected officials, uh, and appointed officials that returned the questionnaire. The, some state elected officials were interviewed by questionnaire, and they've been meeting monthly to determine their findings. As you see, the first line is from the Pennsylvania Constitution outlining what the rights, the municipalities should have the right and power to frame and adopt a home rule charter. This is where they are. Uh, obviously, the check marks are the voters approved the Government Study Commission in May. The uh, elected at the same election, they had to answer a question yes or no and also pick some members of the commission. They are currently in the study phase of nine months, as you heard. Uh, they have nine months for the certification of their election to, to uh, do an adequate study and to come up with conclusions on whether or not to proceed to draft a charter. If they decide to draft the charter, <coughs> they get an additional nine months, and that would go towards deliberations on their part, building on what they learned in the structural study phase. They will have decisions to make on the form of legislative body, the governing body, whether or not there's an executive, uh, the appointed departments, who appoints, who does a budget, uh, rules for ordinance adoption, essentially designing a government structure that operates from the ground up. That charter will be published as part of the final report. The final report typically would be an educational document that would explain the reasons behind the uh, vote to decide to go with the charter or not. Um, 
and the charter itself is part of the Home Rule Commission's final report. All that is then translated to a voter question by the Bureau of Elections, and all citizens, at um, regardless of party, can vote yes or no at an upcoming election determined by the Commission whether or not to accept or reject the charter. If they accept the charter, the charter will have within its terms a transition period, an implementation period. There's a transition committee potential. There are uh, potentials for transition of uh, currently elected officials. Uh, if the voters reject the charter, the uh, charter question cannot be asked again for four years, five years, five years. Uh, so this question will uh, will will go before the voters, and it's an important question because it blocks off. Uh, additional questions and the law requires the government study commission to educate the voters on its results so they will be able to provide information to the voters in a run-up to the election so that an educational campaign is held explaining what the choices of uh, the charter would mean I'll turn it over to Fred now for the remainder thank you Jerry again Fred Brady I'm also with the Pennsylvania Economy League, uh, previously uh, 30 years with the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. The commission has been uh, working very hard over the last number of months, starting in June. Uh, we were selected as the consultant to assist them. We have provided them with extensive amounts of information as part of the study phase for them to look at. Uh, we provided them with a breakdown of the current uh, Charter, the option A provisions. Uh, we went through that and provided a lot of details with that. Uh, we've also provided uh, information on the third class city code. Uh, currently, the commission is involved with a, a number of interviews. Uh, as uh, Mr. Cross indicated, they basically have been done in questionnaire form, but they have uh, sent out and received responses back from a number of uh, individuals, the elected officials of the city, mayor, council president, controller, and treasurer, as well as uh, city department heads, in order to understand the relationship that those offices have to the current form of government and their thoughts as to how, uh, whether it is effective in providing necessary and vital services to the citizens of the city of Lancaster. Uh, they're about to embark upon a comparison of other municipalities that's on the agenda for this evening to uh, further discuss. We've been uh, assisting in trying to identify municipalities that are comparable to Lancaster uh, and have suggested seven, uh, seven different municipalities to take a look at. Uh, some have the current form of government that Lancaster has, uh, others have uh, a, a somewhat different form of government that they may be currently home ruled uh, or they may have rejected a home rule charter so that the commission can get a broad understanding of uh, some of the different forms of government, the reasons why those forms of government have been implemented in those municipalities, uh, whether they are effective or not. Uh, and that's going to be happening over the next <coughs> one, two months. Now I want to really point out the fact that citizens of the city have been involved in every step of the process. As has been indicated, all of the commission's meetings are public. Of course, the process started with a vote by the electorate of the city of Lancaster to approve a home rule study commission to start the process to examine the current form of government and determine its effectiveness. Uh, the public meetings have been held on a regular monthly basis. Uh, they have been uh, broadcast uh, on a, a live stream uh, YouTube network or other uh, related uh, uh, technology uh, social media networks. The uh, citizens uh, will have an opportunity to continue to have input as the commission continues their deliberations on whether or not uh, to move to the second stage of drafting a home rule charter. Uh, a local home rule charter shifts the responsibility 
uh, and the authority to act on citizens' needs from state law to a local charter. Currently, without a charter, municipalities are only authorized to do what state law provides for. Uh, basically, it's, it's a concept known as Dillon's Law, and they are only able to do what is already uh, what legislation is already in place, the third class city code and uh, various uh, uh, other statutes that are applicable. With home rule, the city has the ability to determine the best form of government that can meet the citizens of the city's needs, that is able to provide a efficient, effective services to the residents of Lancaster. The uh, steps that are, are to follow, basically there are two. One, if the commission at the end or during the latter stages of that initial nine month period decides to vote yes, we want to enact a charter, we want to draft a charter, then they have an additional nine months as has been discussed um, to draft that charter. That charter will then go to the electorate to determine whether that charter meets the needs of the city and the city uh, would be better off to operate under that charter as opposed to the current form of government. If this, the uh, commission votes no, the commission then drafts a final report. Uh, they file that final report and the city would continue to operate <coughs> under the current third class city optional charter plan A provisions. That there would be no change in government uh, from what exists currently. And as I believe Mr. Cross indicated, the issue of home rule cannot be revisited again for a period of five years. So those are the two options that the commission has and they'll be making that decision sometime in the uh, mid to late January time period. With that, you know, I'd like to open it up for any questions that any uh, of the commission members or the audience may have. Okay, first, uh, thank you very much uh, <coughs> for the presentation. Uh, we, this is public comment, so uh, first, first, I, I do want, we are a nonpartisan commission. Uh, we're not elected by party. Um, just sort of a, a full, full disclosure. I do want to recognize we have candidates for office uh, in the audience. Uh, Mayor Sirachi, thank you for, for being here again, again tonight. Um, Mr. Shell, a you are Willie Shell, right? I, I, I said, we, we've talked many times. I, I thought, and you didn't look when I said your name. I thought, oh my God, did I just pick the wrong person? <laughs> how, many, how many times have we talked at the Y? Yeah. So, uh, so Mr. Shell is a candidate for city council, and Bob Hollister, Mr. Hollister, is a candidate for county commissioner. So just letting everybody on the commission, if they may or may not have known that, uh, and members of the audience, uh, and open for any questions you have for PEL, any questions you have for us, or any just comments that you would like to make for the record. Uh, if you do decide to speak, ask, I think we have, we have a microphone, uh, do ask for your name and the city in which you live. So open up for public comments. Mr. Shell. Do you want the microphone or do you think your voice can? I think my voice is loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> could, could, would you stand up? Uh, that, that would make it easier. So, my name is Willie Shell Sr. I live in Lancaster City, and I live two blocks from the Stevens Trade, to be exact. Uh, I just want to know that seven uh, comparable study that you've given to the commission, are uh, they available to the public? Yes. Yes, yes, they will be. They're going to be discussing that this evening. Yeah. Okay. Everything, we put everything up on the website. If you home rule study commission section of the website, and there's a uh, meeting minutes, meeting agenda, and meeting materials, and the meeting materials will be the most informative. It's all the materials we've read to prepare Thank you. ourselves. Also, I do have some door hanging for anybody who wants to okay. read about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Shepard.
any any other comments? I do have one. Sure. Please. I think I'm loud enough. Sure. Um, do I have to say my name? Name name in the street in which you live. Okay, Susie Gomez, uh, 115 North Reservoir Street, Lancaster. Um, my question is, um, who is the electorate in our city who voted this in? Any registered voter was allowed to vote uh, on the question. Uh, was it the taxpayer registered? A registered voter, as long any, as they're registered. Any registered voters yep. Yep. voted this homeroom charter? With that, those who were allowed elected. to vote. Yes, well, I don't know the study It's a study commission at this point. Study commission, yeah. study commission. Right. sorry. Yeah. Thank you for the correction. And I don't know if the question is for you, but why do we need a charter? Well, that's what we're studying. This is a study? Well, actually, I think a clarification. We have a charter. We have yeah. a charter. We have a charter. We come, we are currently, op the city operates under the uh, Harrisburg in 1957, uh, enacted a law that is the third class, third class city charter, in which there are, I guess it would be three options, two options or three options. Two. Um, two. two. Two, option A and option B. Uh, in sometime around 1957, Lancaster City chose to follow option A. Uh, the requirement was they had to choose one or the other, that the city lays out the charter. So the charter, I, I view the charter as effectively a constitution. Uh, this is, these are the rules. Constitution lays out everything, in this case the city, that they must do that they have no choice, they absolutely must do this, such as how they have police protection, how they have fire, uh, and at the same time, anything that they may not do at all, that are forbidden for doing. And right now, that comes under the charter that was written by the Commonwealth in 1957. What we're doing now is studying to make a decision as to whether we would like to separate from that and write our own charter and say we, we have different ideas and we would like to, to change something. We may change it, if possible we could change a lot. It's possible we could enact a new charter that changes very little. But it would give us the opportunity to say whether or not we want to. So the first phase is whether we do it or not. And then the second phase would be whether we write this new charter. So we currently do have a charter. And the reason for the charter, whether it's current or not, uh, is for the people, the citizens of Lancaster, the community to establish uh, good mo good taxation. Well, taxation is, is just one part of it. Uh, it's a big part of it. It's a part that impacts every single one of us. Uh, for the most part, we all live in the city. Uh, well, everybody up here lives in the city, so any any taxes that uh, any tax issues would affect us directly. Um, I I think it's important to recognize that a charter does not set taxes. It more would say the current charter says what taxes are allowed. City council and the mayor can set the actually set the taxes. The, the commission does not. Thank you for um, explaining that. Because the mayor is saying that we're to be taxed more on an income tax bracket and a property tax bracket when the homeroom charter comes into play. So that I know this is a homeroom study, but I need for you guys to really, really understand the whole purpose of the homeroom study. And what is the reason behind it? Is it going to affect the citizens of Lancaster? Or is it going to help us in terms of just putting a blank? Is it going to help us or is it not going to help us? Now, my other question goes to you. Um, I know um, you guys are familiar with the Local Tax Enabling Act of 19, December 31, 1965. Okay. Um, it was amended by Act of November 30, 2004, correct? to allow any political subdivision to collect delinquent earned income per capita occupation and occupational privilege taxes and to assess fees for the cost of co collection 
and any necessary legal representation. My question is, have you already read the Tax Enabling Act? Um, are you guys familiar with the Tax Enabling Act from 1965 that was amended in 2000? We went over portions of it. They gave us information for portions of it. Okay. And what is going to make a difference from that act mm -hmm. that is already in force and we are paying these taxes already? Is it going to offer a solution? Um, is the homeroom charter, and I, I know we're, it's a study phase, but I, I want to bring clarity because it's important because we as taxpayers, citizens of Lancaster City, are also going to be a part of this. We are the public. We're the people. So we're going to be a part of it regardless. It, it is very important um, for us because we are the ones who are going to be affected by it. We have already been affected by it. There's taxes increasing every time. So I just want to pay a little bit more attention to the Tax Enabling Act that divided us by class. Okay, I'm well aware of that. And I want you to really, really understand the purpose of the Home Room Charter. Because I don't see a difference, but thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other public comments? Please. My name is Delia Sanchez, and I live on Palm Street, Lancaster City. Um, I just want to get familiar with everybody. If you can introduce yourselves, um, what do you do, and why you chose to be part of these home rule, this Home Rule Commission. We'll start from this side or that side? Whichever side you desire. <laughs> all right. Then I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go ahead if that's all right with you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I, if, if I, I will, just, just to say um, that while every, everybody has a, a right to speak, nobody is in any, any, ever in any under, under any obligation to do so. So if, if you, for some reason, you do not want to, I mean, that's up to you. That's up to the individual commissioners. I, I can't make anybody speak, but if they would like to, I also can't stop them. So if, if you would like to, please go ahead. So uh, I'm Tony Dastra. Uh, I work for Lancaster Township, and I'm, a, I'm an administrative assistant for Public Works and Planning and Zoning. Uh, what interested me in the Home Rule Study Commission was back in 2017, I ran for mayor with a funny hat on. And one of my big things was I was interested in the idea of restructuring government, but there were definitely limitations on how and the process for that. So when this came about, I was like, this this is what I've been talking about. Like, I, I saw a need, uh, and this process actually is very open for us in the sense that cities and municipalities are creatures of the state. So what that means and what, in relevance to the charter question, we are prevented by state and federal law in terms of what we can do. What the what home rule charters allow us to do is essentially take the gaps within the law and fill them. Like as an example, something the charter can affect explicitly is like gun control and gun rights, things of that nature. That's an outline, you can't really touch that issue. But uh, structure of government, you have a lot of flexibility there. There's hybrid models we can take if we were to draft the charter. Uh, but then somewhere where it's like a mix is taxation. So the four main taxes we have, local services tax, real estate transfer tax, income tax, and property tax. Uh, at this point, the city's only able to really affect property taxes. So while we can't create new taxes, we can fluctuate the rate, or rather fluctuate the range in which these taxes can fall. The, the government, meaning your city council and mayor, in a potential new charter would set those rates, but this is what would influence that. Um, and I could go into more detail, but that's, yeah. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Elias, and I am a licensed social worker. I work at uh, LGH. And I think this, is, this whole process is very much gonna affect uh, everyone, and I wanted to be a part of it. 
um, and just honored to be a part of it. Um, my name is John McGran. We've known each other for a while. Um, I own a small business. I've raised my family in the city. I've lived in the city 25 of the last 30 years of my life. And I <clears throat> feel like it's an opportunity. If, you know, if we're going to explore this, I'm excited to be a part of it, um, to see if we can find the best way to you know, discover the best way to fund the services that the city provides to taxpayers and residents in a way that's as fair as possible, and also to take advantage of the opportunity to evaluate whether the structure and form of our government is the best to serve our community. Uh, introducing myself, I'm Brian Adams. I'm a professor of statistics at Penn State. Uh, I'm kind of reiterating what Mr. Dastra said. Uh, we're a lot, of, a lot of agreement as to why we want to be on this, uh, whether, whether we agree on, on what needs to be done, that's what will be decided later. But uh, I, I just, I, when the opportunity arose, my thought was I want to be involved in what is potentially the ultimate role of, of the people is deciding what they want to do. Uh, it's not what we want to do, it's what you all want to do. Um, and it's very clear that at every step that the people have a say. Uh, and that's why, and I wanted to be involved with it. Thank you. My name is Amy Rufo. I'm an executive assistant at um, Franklin and Marshall. I'm also a volunteer for Fair Districts uh, PA to reform our redistricting process. I just um, got involved because it's a nonpartisan um, group of people, and I'm interested in how our city can stay uh, fiscally sound and provide the services to the citizens which folks need and deserve. Good evening, my name is Maxine Cook. I am uh, spent the last 40 plus years living in the southeast of Lancaster. I am a tax paying individual. I pay property taxes as well. When the opportunity was presented to me to become a part of the Home Rule Study Commission, I was interested um, because I'm at a point where I want to understand more in depth how the city works and the information that came to me was that by 2025, the city of Lancaster will be in a deficit. And I want to understand that because I want to understand what has already happened to get us to this point. What's happened before now to get us to this point that we are in a deficit. Um, so I like research. I've worked in higher education for close to 25 years. I love research and I want to dive into these details that seem to be eluding me right now. And besides all of the education that uh, <laughs> Tony gave, um, to piggyback off of all of that, um, yeah, I, I, I want to learn and understand and want to be able to speak to my community to say uh, what is going on um, in layman's terms and uh, how we might be able to, or what the opportunity will be to the community to say um, no to a home rule charter or yes to a home rule charter and all of the reasons why and why not. Hi, I'm Darlene Bird, longtime resident in the Southeast area. I ran for the commission because I feel we need a voice for the people. I understand when people are saying that taxes are too high. I understand when we have elderly people saying they can't no longer afford to live in the city. And I see this firsthand knowledge. So when we came to have a disposition for the commission, I definitely wanted to be that voice because I know what they're going through. I know what the struggle is. And we can't say we're going to fix it because we're going to change the taxes. One of the things I learned in the study is that that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. And I want to make sure if we're going to get a charter that it is going to do what we say it's going to do, especially for the elderly, especially for the poor people within the community, people who can't no longer afford to pay their rent, you know, that are homeowners, you know, and we have a lot of stuff that I feel that we could change. 
Now, will it really be what affects us? I don't know that yet. And that's why I want to be a part of the commission. I want to study it. I don't have my mind made up whether I'm for it or against it at this point. I want to study it. I want to see. One of the things I can tell you I feel about the earned income tax, I think that is a good, that that could be a, a resource of revenue. But my question that I will ask our commission is that right now we have department heads in the city that are making six figures and right. don't even live in the city and will not be affected by this earned income. Correct. But I don't think we need to have change a charter to have that because there was a time in city government when department heads were required to live in the city. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are just things that are floating in my head. I'm not saying I'm going to be for it or against it, but these are the type of things that I know. And I would like to see how that effect is going to work. Hello, I'm Carl Feldman. I live in the northeast part of Webster City. Uh, I work for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I used to live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I'm very familiar with the struggles that Pennsylvania's third class cities have around the state. Um, and all of them say pretty much the same thing. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania does not set up uh, Pennsylvania's municipalities to succeed, which is really unfortunate. And I'm hopeful that through the study of a home rule uh, charter, uh, we can determine if there are tools available to us to make sure that we can better and more efficiently and equitably fund our city services that we all rely on every single day. Thank you. I appreciate everybody taking the time out to give me a little bit of background on um, where you're from and why you are passionate about the study. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I got a comment, if I will. Yes? If nobody's in the state. Um, my comment. Do I have to say my name then? No. No. We, we, we still won't. I remember who you are. Okay. <laughs> my comment, um, and it's just a comment, uh, there's a thing called accountability. And I don't think that people are really, really grasping, taxpayers, I'm not going to say people, because we're all taxpayers, we're all citizens here. There's, a, there's an accountability to the taxpayers, to the citizens of Lancaster. Um, Lidditz is the number five richest country in America right now, <coughs> and they're in our backyard. Um, I can go on, but you guys got to do your history. Lancaster is very, very um, uh, wealthy. It really is. We, we have a multitude of people who work collectively along with our visitors that come in from every country. Uh, into our city, um, we are we have so much revenue drawing into this city as we speak. Our problem is today, not tomorrow. Our issue is today, not tomorrow. Our concerns are for today, not tomorrow. Our children are dying today, not tomorrow. Our taxpayers are hurting today, not tomorrow. Our citizens, residents of the city of Lancaster, are in need today, not tomorrow. I understand this is a homeroom study, but there's a thing called accountability. And I think that people need to be held accountable for the misuse of funds in this city. And I, I'll sit down now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to next item on the agenda. Uh, we received responses from the treasurer. Uh, we did, did get them. So they were sent out a few days ago. Uh, I don't know if they're whatever. I'm trying to find mine. Uh, anyways, there any, any discussion? Uh, it's a moment to review any discussion, comments that. There we go. On the treasurer's on the, responses. On the treasurer's responses. Yes. Mm -hmm. um. Mr. Chair. Yeah, hey, Mr. Feldman. Thank you. Um, the treasurer's response was not, um, was different than I think uh, response to a similar question that were posed to the mayor and the council president. 
around the arrangement of the duties of the office. Uh, the treasurer stated to the question, I'll just read in full if you don't mind. Do you believe the current arrangement in which the daily duties of the office of treasurer are signed over to the administration leads to good customer service? And the response that was given was, I do not believe this process ensures great customer service, nor do I believe if the treasurer elect was maintaining the signed over duties that it will guarantee good customer service. I do believe that the elected city treasurer and elected controller should have more interaction with and or authority over the city treasurer department. Because of the uh, difference in the response, I guess I'd like to have the treasurer come in and say mm -hmm. what he means. Mm -hmm. So I don't know yeah, that we can really yeah. discuss it in his absence, but right, yeah. I'm sure we can ask him to come. That's a great idea. Okay. Um, I mean, we can invite him. Again, we, we can't force him to come in, but we can invite him to come in. Uh, is there a, a time that uh, the next I mean, we're talking, we'd like to invite him in and the ask him if he would come in for December? We can do that. Any other comments? I guess along that line, I'd like to make sure that the city business administrator is present um, at that same meeting. Because I think they work together quite a bit. Now, do we have, um, that, that was the, the list of questions we haven't gotten responses for yet, um, was on that. I know, I know that. I'm just oh, saying okay. if the treasurer's going to come in and speak about um, opinions on the role and uh, the components that are signed over to the business administrator's office, I think it would only be fair to the business administrator uh, to come in and talk about their involvement in those activities. Mm -hmm. So if we can have them both be together, that would be nice. And I know, as you said, they don't have to. Um, can, uh, actually, can I, I just, I'm sorry, I'll I'm right back to you. I just want to check with, with our the solicitor. Can we do that? Why do not? we have the authority to yeah. just invite? You can ask. Yeah. No, there is no legal obligation whatsoever for anybody to appear before you. Okay, that, that's what I wanted a clarification on. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yes, Ms. Rufo. Did, did anyone else, I, I don't know if I was accurate in my assessment, but I felt like some of the answers that the treasurer put in his his or her document were exactly the same as the controllers. Is that? Did anyone else? Uh, that? Honestly, I think the treasurer was a little more extensive than mm -hmm. the controller okay. was. All right. In my opinion, I would like to make the comment about the um, treasurer. Um, just that it was very surprising to me that the um, treasurer has little to no. Um, interaction with city council according to his response his or her response um and not even involved directly with the budget creation process um so that was of um interest to me and i was surprised to know that that they're not involved mr chair mr fallon I was looking at this and I, the way I thought about that response was just that he said that he did not understand that to be part of his role. And I, at least to be honest, that's, I also kind of understood his role to be that way. They evaluate the... Um, P-E-L. Yeah. Could you remind us the role of the treasurer controller, the treasurer within um, our type of city government? The treasurer is a separately elected individual, basically responsible for the collection of real estate and related revenues, uh, not the earned income tax, but the real estate uh, revenues that come in uh, to the city. Is it, I mean, it, is it, does that position typically or ever get involved in budget developments for cities or is that Typically, typically only to the degree that it would impact their office. You know, they would submit, it, it would be 
common that the treasurer would submit a budgetary request for their office, but beyond that, typically not. And, and, and for revenue projection, how's delinquencies, you know, how's the progress of the collecting the taxes current year so they can consider what the budget could consider as revenue of the following year, that kind of information. And for third class cities, a treasurer, the elected treasurer position is always a part time position? Not always. Not, not always. always. Um, in general, I mean, not all third class cities even have an elected treasurer. Mm -hmm. You know, that position uh, has been, uh, uh, is not part of the structure of some third class cities. Okay. It depends on the form of government that they have been. Go ahead, Mr. Fowler. Along similar lines, on the Home Rule Study Commissions that have taken place, how many of them have changed the roles of the Treasurer and Controller? Do you have a sense? In a number of instances, if it has been a city where there was an elected official and they've gone Home Rule, uh, that position has been eliminated. Treasurer and Controller? Uh, or one or the other? In Several instances that I'm aware of both have been eliminated. Question Does the treasurer and the controller are they not to check some balances? The treasurer, is that the purpose? Yeah, the treasurer, the, the controller position is a check and balance position. Mm -hmm. The treasurer position is not a check and balance position, it's mm -hmm. a receiver of revenue. Mm -hmm. And in our form of government and the way Lancaster City runs, does not the treasurer, our treasurer, sign over his responsibilities to the business administration office and he does not do those things as that you said was his responsibility? Well, I think that I, I would rather have the meeting in December where you have the DA and the treasurer there to describe how they interact together. I, I can't really answer that question. So you don't know how our treasure works. I, I have not. No. Okay. No. Mr. McGrady, I, mean, I guess I'm trying to get a little bit more clarity. You know, to the question of how how frequently either or both of these offices are um, eliminated in, in the course of a home rule study, and you said several. Would you say it happens <laughs> more often? It, does that happen in in more situations than not? In my experience, yes. Yeah, in my experience, yes. And, and when we say eliminated, in my experience, the necessity of election of a treasurer is eliminated, not necessarily the functions of a treasurer. Right. So that would be uh, either a, an appointed person or a uh, combination. Uh, right, we're not talking about not performing the function. No. no. We're talking about you know no longer sustaining it as an elected office. Right. The right. treasurer in a third class city is analogous to the elected tax collector in the borough and township. Right. Yep. So um, those, if the borough and township wanted to eliminate their elected tax collector, they would use a home rule process and then they would delegate who would collect the taxes. They wouldn't stop collecting yep. taxes. Right. Yeah. And the yep. controller function has, in my experience, been changed uh, in some. Uh, home rule charters, particularly in the county level, where um, the, the controller became, the uh, most recent example was uh, Luzerne County, where they redefined the controller's position to be an internal auditor um, and the ability to, to uh, audit the performance of departments. Okay. Yeah. Because you can redefine so, the roles. So if I, would, so, so, so if I was going to say most of the time, Treasurer is eliminated. Sometimes controller is eliminated, and sometimes controller is retained but redefined. Right. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know, at the uh, at the end of the fiscal year, typically there is a CPA firm, certified public accounting firm, that undertakes the comprehensive audit mm -hmm. function. Yeah not the controller. Right. Got it. Thank you. Ms. Bird, do you have a question? You, you, you look like you're ready, you're ready to jump in. Please do. Right. Right. Yeah. 
So um, can you tell us who is actually collecting our taxes now in the city? I, I that piece said that. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Mayor. I mean, it's not the, the, the treasurer the, we just said. We have the Treasury Bureau. Um, that is under the uh, direction of the Director of Administrative Services, mm -hmm. receives the revenues uh, for the City of Lancaster. They include tax revenues as well as the revenues that are for our enterprise funds, mm -hmm. our water, wastewater, um, stormwater, trash, and recycling bills. Are All of those funds are paid uh, through our Treasury office, mm -hmm. um, and we have a bureau chief. Her name is Julie. Right. Great. And so does our treasurer relinquish his rights as a treasurer as defined under the option way charter? Does he sign over and say, I give this responsibility to the people that you just mentioned? Joe. So um, I'm gonna ask uh, Barry about that. My understanding over time is that the roles and function of this, I mean, uh, our total revenues just in the general fund are $72 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there's a, um, it is um, an intensive amount of work and there are a number of people that work in that bureau. And so that those functions are ostensibly managed by paid full-time staff. Mm -hmm. uh, the deputy, there's a, there is an agreement between the treasurer um, and the city. Uh, the treasurer has appointed deputy treasurer, which is in the city. Okay. The treasurer is not required to do so. The treasurer agreed to do so. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a past practice for many years, mm -hmm. in part because, quite frankly, um, a part-time volunteer person mm -hmm. could not functionally do the role of treasurer, as the mayor indicated, um, okay. to perform those services. They would need to be full-time and have, as we indicated, we have the Treasury Bureau, which, which does more than just collects taxes, right. has 17 people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's a, it's a full staff to receive all of the revenues. Now they do more than just taxes, which is the Treasurer's sole responsibility. So that includes, that Bureau collects our water and uh, sewer utility payments, mm -hmm. um, our trash payments, um, uh, and multiple, multiple mm -hmm. other payments that are made to the city. Um, but there is an agreement that's in place uh, between uh, the Treasurer and the city that he authorizes uh, city staff to perform those functions. And that has been, like you said, a practice. That's been a past practice for a long time. A long time. Yeah. And is that the same thing with the controller? Does he turn over any no. of his? No. No. And the control, the controller performs his functions, mm -hmm. uh, as indicating the third class city code. He does sign off on uh, contracts and expenditures, which is really his role is to affirm is to affirm that expenditures made by the city have been appropriated by proper ordinance of city council. Mm -hmm. And so there is a process by which he does that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's through our centralized purchasing system. Um, that system, again, is administered in the Department of Administrative Services. Because mm -hmm. I know one his question, believe it, but his question, on his questions, he didn't say that he took on all that responsibility mm -hmm. when he answered the questions that we had gave him mm -hmm. the control of. So I was wondering, is there somebody else that's doing it? Because in his response to our question, it was like, I'm not going in there every day and checking or every week or you know whatever no, it's taken. I, and, I, and I can tell you that um, he has performed his functions because there have been occasions where uh, he has reached out to me because a request for a, an expenditure, a contract, an invoice has come to him and he questioned whether the proper procurement methods were utilized. And you know, in fact, they were, but he yeah. was doing his job to okay. properly push. And I'll just add that those positions are not volunteer positions, they're paid mm -hmm. positions, yes. and that they can also be eligible for uh, city uh, benefits. The controller, the controller and the treasurer are paid yeah, they're, positions. They're, they're paid. Um, they're not it's one of the perks. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a very nominal time. amount of money, but it is paid. Mr. Fowler, please. We spoke at the last meeting about scenarios with the controller's office where if the controller did not approve something it could be a problem and you said there actually has been occasions over the years where the controller did not approve the city took the controller to court and was ultimately made to um, or I don't know about made to but they were not successful and the city prevailed what about a scenario in which there was an election and the treasurer did not sign over the responsibilities 
for tax collection, what would happen in that scenario? Well, the treasurer would have to be would be performing the roles and would take on the duties that are currently assigned to city staff and would have to do them of course with the third class city but an optional charter. But would the staff having uh, if this individual did not sign over those functions, would the staff still report to the no, selected treasurer? They're not employees of him, of him or her in your scenario. Um, under that scenario, the, the treasurer would need to develop his or her own staff to do their work. Okay. And that's where he would set his budget that we were talking about a little earlier. Potentially. I mean, we haven't, we haven't had that situation in, you know, obviously, uh, uh, many, many years that I'm aware of. Uh, I've been around only, you know, I'm, I'm not the oldest person around, but I've been around a little while, and we haven't had that situation around. The oldest person would be Tucky. <laughs> That's right. We remember that from last week. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. McGrath. So, the, just to make sure I understand this correctly, so the Treasury Bureau Chief, the, the, the responsibilities of the Treasurer are you know, sort of effectively reassigned to the Treasury Bureau Chief. Under the current agreement, yes. As, as we, it, as, you know, that's been our tradition. And then, the, so the Treasury Bureau Chief reports to the mayor? The director of the Department of Administrative Services. Department of Administrative Services, okay. So the Department of Administrative Services houses four separate components. It houses accounting, it houses treasury, it houses information, data and information technology, and it houses human resources. Okay, got it, thank you. And it sounds like from this um, the treasurer's um, response, he worked with Patrick, who was the right. former um, business administrator fairly closely, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now we no longer have that position, correct? No, they do. You, re you hired a business administrator, yes, right? Tina Campbell is now the director of the business. Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Um not directly related to the responses, but kind of following up a little bit on uh, elected positions and a question I asked at a previous meeting. Um, is there any uh, response back on whether or not if a new charter could make these positions in the same way we were elected as nonpartisan figures, uh, local elections to be nonpartisan as well? That would be directed to so. PEL. You, you need Is to it? follow the state election code. That's a um, for a law on general uh, application, so you, the answer would be no. No, okay. Yeah. So, okay. You have to follow the election code. Gotcha. I just wasn't sure if the election code was like, it has to be uh, party races or not. Uh, okay, but that answers that. And then the, uh, the second question I had somewhat relates to the functions of the Treasury, and I don't know if this is a novel concept or if another community has done it. Um, and especially because the city manages utility fees, I mean, at a recent council meeting, something like uh, processing fees was brought up as a concern, uh, even though the city can't just build those fees into the structure. Are local municipal treasuries allowed to act in some capacity as holder of funds for the public so that, uh, let's just say hypothetically, a, a member of the public has a bill, they willfully submit to the city a, uh, a large sum of money and say, I want you to take these funds out of this account for me and pay collectively these fees to uh, whatever service provider. Is that any, am I talking crazy here? Can you be a little more direct about what you're talking about? Because I honestly don't understand. I'm not okay. familiar with so, <laughs> It would be uh, like a prepayment, to Tony? Huh? Are you talking about a prepayment? Sort of, yes. It's like, would the city treasury, has it, has it ever been done or could it be possible for the treasury to hold funds so that they could be used, not necessarily as a prepayment, but so that instead of the resident needing to jump into the system and paying the processing fee every time, uh, whatever residents opt into that system, hypothetically. So, uh, Mr. Dester, I'll just answer this a little bit. Uh, <coughs> The answers are maybe, um, and maybe. Uh, as attorneys often say, um, there is often a path to get to where you want to go. Um, I think there are a lot of issues associated with what you propose that really aren't relevant to this consideration. Um, those are really more functional in terms of 
how the bureau operates, what's fair across the board. Okay. Um, is it actually equitable uh, sure. to think about doing that for one? Um, is it cost efficient? Is it effective? Which means would also be equitable to others to do it that way. Um, procedurally, might there be a way to do it? Yes. I, I think that's what your um, your officials in running systems are supposed to determine the best ways. Those are a possibility of concepts. I'm not sure that's relevant directly <coughs> to, the, to the Home Rule Charter and the process. Um, and I say that not trying to be disrespectful. I'm saying yeah, that's okay. in all seriousness that I don't think it's, that's more of a function of how government operates, not, not the structure of government, but actually the functionality of government. Um, and it's a process question. Okay. There's a, um, no? No. Yeah, I have another question. Yes, Ms. Burke. So um, at our last um, meeting, we talked about the PFM report, and we talked about how we got part of the report, and I guess because of COVID, the rest of the report didn't come out, mm -hmm. and we were supposed to get that. Did we I think get that's that? my, my fault. I, that completely went off my radar. Okay. Um, I will see if I can get that taken care so, of a little bit. Sorry, that's, I, I apologize. As soon as you said that, I suddenly the light bulb went off. It's like, oh, that's right. Uh, and and for the public, sometimes I'm just not very good at my job. <laughs> that's a report that the state did to find out. I guess when we just thought we were going in a crisis, the state did from 2019 and projected out five years what our finances would look like, which was got us into this position. And then the COVID hit, we got part of the report and not the rest of the report. So, I don't think it was the state. Yeah, can well, I, I think the mayor yeah. Required, yeah. asked the state to. Yes. If I could just take a walk back in history. Okay. Um, Thank you. We had a management assistance report that was done in 2006 when Mayor Gray came into office mm -hmm. and was projecting a $72 million deficit, um, and I think over the next five years. And over time, it has been that structural deficit. So, this goes way, way back. And periodically we have done um, reviews of, of five year projections and actually at the end of every budget presentation that's in online, you will see a five year projection that's showing the city in a deficit. Um, we've been able to mitigate that through a, a lot of different things um, over time, including tax increases, but also cuts in spending, uh, one time windfalls like when Park City sold and we got a million dollars in a real estate transfer tax. We hired the uh, through um, PFM, that was through the same grant stream that DCD is paying for this process. They routinely help communities either avoid going into municipal bankruptcy or help them come out of it. And so we asked the state to support us in doing a financial review of our operations and to essentially uh, review our projections, our financial projections, and that is the information that PFM has presented was that five-year assessment. Now I need to look at what materials are online and, and I'm making a note of what may be missing um, to, to help you follow up because I, I'm not sure what what was shared with uh, with the Home Rule Commission. But just to provide some context, these, these five-year look-aheads are, are, have been a practice of the city and have been reviewed each budget year, um, but this was an outside review with a review of our operations to look at where we could be more efficient and save money. And we've been able to implement some of those changes and others have not quite worked out the way that we anticipated because of a variety of factors, most especially COVID. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, other, Mr. Feldman. So I, I know this because we've had this commission here, and we've been talking about this for a while, but I think what was said, hey, in 2006, we had a projection and five years we'd be in a large deficit is important because I think we think now like, oh, hey, in a couple of years, we'll be in a huge deficit. It's like, okay, well, we said that a while ago. And what I, and what I think we has been shared with us and what was just said too, and is that every time something happens, uh, we get lucky. The American Rescue Plan Act passes and we get a bunch of money that we can use for revenue replacement. Or uh, we cut things, we cut things, we cut things, we cut things. 
or we don't hire positions, or we find some money, you know, and I just want to say, like, you always do those projections out, and you always do, if you, you do your own budgeting for a business or an organization, you do what you have to do each additional year, but the idea that this one-way ratchet just continues to turn on city services is a problem, and I think it's a big part of our fear. So I don't say that because, like, oh, see, we're never actually going to get to um, hitting that cliff. Well, eventually there'll be something people don't want to cut enough, you know. And I, I personally hope we don't have to get there. Or there won't be something lucky in our city sale or rescue. Well, I remember in the, I might be incorrect on the numbers of this, but back when the Great Recession happened, uh, Mayor Gray asked nonprofit property owners uh, if they would be willing to pay into the system even though they didn't need to. I, I think, what, like 25% uh, at least? I don't know the number of how many paid in, but I know it helped. No, it's not good. They already have them. <laughs> and not good. Um, another question I have is um, we talked about um, that we would uh, we hire an auditor to do the audit at the end of I guess the fiscal year I guess we just had one yeah at the um, at the city council where we had an audit report and I noticed that they picked and choose chose what um, areas they were going to audit like they didn't have to pick all of them is that correct? Uh, no, they, they audit uh, the core functions of the city. It is the associated authorities that they do not audit. So like the Lancaster Parking Authority, um, there's, there's a whole list of, of uh, component units of government that are not in the direct control or purview of uh, Lancaster City Council or myself or who have money that runs through, this, through uh, city government. So those component units were not audited, but our city government operations are, and we continue to meet all of our audit requirements. I just noticed one of them was, which is like a little pet peeve of mine, was the water and sewer, that they didn't provide any information on at council, said they chose not to, they didn't audit that for some reason. At least in the report that they gave the council. On that one. It is a public utility. It has to meet public utility commission standards. Mm -hmm. I'm just getting an explanation. If we are yeah. hiring an auditor to audit, I just need to try to kind of like get my hand around yeah. and my head around and understand what parts are we auditing of the government. And I know when I was at council, they said we chose not to, we did not do the water and sewer fund. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back it out to that, Darlene, know. because okay. uh, there's a. a I want to speak correctly to your question, okay. so I'll Thank I'll re we'll send an answer to okay. um, the chair to disseminate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, we. I, I want to keep things moving. We also have the uh, state elected officials' responses to discuss. If we can uh, keep the discussion moving on with with that, we received. We had sent a, a list of questions to Senator Martin, uh, Representative smith Waydell, and Representative Sterla, and received their answers. I, I realized that uh, the, the response from uh, Senator Martin and from Senator smith Waydell only came yesterday, but uh, hopefully everybody got a copy of that. Any any comments or for discussion? Yeah, I want to comment. Please, Mr. Dashford. So I, I appreciated what I think it was. Uh, I'm just pulling it up right now. I think it was Representative Smith Waydell said. Uh, let me verify. Yes, in terms of property taxes, like the possibility for an income floor to be created uh, through some of the adjustments to taxation powers because I think like something that uh, certain groups of residents are interested in, specifically older homeowners who are now building that generational wealth, like that could provide options to protect that wealth. Um, and that that's something to consider when we 
look at the possibility of changing, for example, the income tax structure. Mr. Fowler. I just noted that uh, Rep. smith Boydell said he was working on a bill around payroll preparation tax, and I just don't really know what that is. Just I'm seeing the PEL folks come forward from behind. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah. If you don't I, mind, I'd appreciate it. That uh, tax initially came about uh, as part of the city of Pittsburgh's uh, recovery effort. Um, and there was legislation that uh, amended um, uh, Act 511 to provide for that payroll preparation tax. It has since been expanded. Um, it does uh, provide that option for certain uh, cities. Scranton has implemented that. There are 2A city. Uh, the city of Hazleton, uh, which is a third class city, has also implemented that payroll preparation tax. Whenever it is implemented, you need to eliminate the business privilege mercantile tax. Um, and in the initial year, it needs to be a revenue neutral um, swap, if you will. Uh, the revenue from the mercantile business privilege tax amount um, needs to equal, or let me, the reverse of that, the payroll preparation tax revenue uh, cannot exceed the revenue that is obtained from the business privilege mercantile tax. And you have, it was, it's available to cities, well, any municipality in Act 47. Oh, and the city yeah. is not in Act 47, so they don't have access to that authorization. And what, what is taxed? A payroll, payroll preparation payroll. tax is an employer tax. It's like a head, that head is, head. It's, no, it's, no, it's paid on the gross wages of employers okay. within the jurisdiction. Okay. And we do not have a business mercantile tax, if I remember correctly, right? Correct. Is home rule, does home rule give us the authority to opt into this potential revenue option? I'm just looking no. your eyes no. saying no. The home rule, home rule allows you to uh, tax what's authorized. It really needs uh, state it's legislative it's authorization. Yeah. Yeah. It can be expanded to go beyond Act 47 cities. Citizens. Okay. So hypothetically, let's say, because I'm just thinking about charter, potential charter writing, like if, if we go in and write specific lines about uh, modifications like income tax, for example, would it potentially be uh, beneficial to have a clause about new taxation powers we would be authorized for in the future without specifying them? It's That's standard in the charters, but it's the outline in the powers and duties of the municipality. Okay. And usually it's in under levy, uh, levy taxes and collect taxes. All right. Uh, it, but they have to be authorized. The subjects of taxation cannot be changed by a home rule charter. So you, you know, what, what the legislature allows to be taxed, you can tax. Okay. You, you cannot create new subjects of taxation. Right. In other words, you cannot implement a sales tax or right. another tax that is not currently authorized. Right, I, I just meant like, I mean, let's just use sales tax as a hypothetical example. If in the future a municipality were authorized, um, I guess, is there an option to have a more public discussion on how we may then, in the same way we would open up the range of possibilities for income taxes instead of just going with a state figure that is now authorized, opening up a conversation for the range of that new taxation power? That's a, depending on how the legislation is written, the okay. hypothetical, but in the general sense, a tax is levied by ordinance by the governing body. Right. So your charter will have, if you do that, if you do have a charter, it will outline the specific requirements for an ordinance, what should be covered by an ordinance, public participation in an ordinance, public display, uh, how many votes are needed to pass certain kind of ordinances. That, that's all spelled out in the general sense. And because taxes are levied by ordinance, it would be covered by that. And if you wanted to carve out a budget ordinance as a different uh, a different treatment and adoption, you could. You could have different rules for adopting a budget or a taxation ordinance. Okay, thank you. Mr. Um, so in in the response from both uh, Representative Smith Waddell and Representative Sterla, so 
Smith Waddell, you know, alluded to the um, payroll preparation tax is one is something he's working on. Uh, Representative Sterla talked about you know the possibility of authorized you know the, he, he explained he's working on a increase in the sales tax that would be implemented at the county level. Like, do you have any comment on whether either of those? provide a solution, enough of a solution that might mitigate the need to activate income tax in the city of Lancaster. Well, you have an income tax in the city of Lancaster. It's authorized. Uh, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, right. right. Yeah, uh, I'm what's sorry. what's yeah. governed is the rate. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah right. Yep. Uh, okay. But when, you, when it comes to legislative initiatives to help local governments, mm -hmm. Um, I've been around a long time, Fred, longer. Um, I would fall back on the saying, if you live, if you live on hope, you'll die fasting. <laughs> so if you rely on the hope that legislators representing 2,500 local governments will proactively provide different, then that's hope. Uh, right. Sure. Doesn't pay the bills. But if they... If they did, if they did author... If they did. did the governor provided for an optional sales tax uh, in his budget message of 20, uh, 2009 or 10 or whatever it was. Rendell. Rendell in his last Rendell. year. Uh, there was some agreement, there was some not agreement, uh, but even that tax was, uh, didn't go very far because there was an argument about how that tax would be dispersed. Would school districts get it? Would the county get it? The county's levying it? Would municipalities get it? Um, there's only one county that's authorized uh, to have that uh, sales tax, uh, and that is Allegheny County. And okay. it is, there is a formula that distributes it in Allegheny <coughs> County, but that's the only county, and as Jerry indicated, uh, you know, the, the effort uh, back in, uh, like uh, former Governor Rendell was not successful. I think right. his comment, I've been around. Uh, for a number of years, and I've seen, uh, I was involved even in the uh, tax reform legislation of Governor Casey, and uh, was on uh, a roadshow promoting that, and mm -hmm. that uh, would have changed the balance between property tax and earned income tax, and it went down to glorious uh, um, <laughs> failure <laughs> by the electorate. They did not embrace that. So. I, I would agree with Jerry, uh, you know, although I've seen any number of bills promoting legislative change, uh, they have not been able to garner the necessary support necessary to get across the goal line. Mm -hmm. And even if they would, the final structure could be beneficial. It could, could be. be. It could be. But, it, but, it, but it could also be constructed in such a way that it wouldn't provide the desired benefit. Right. A lot of times, when they enact a new tax, they take away something else. Yep. They, it's usually a revenue neutral yep. kind of thing. Yep. But um, with home rule, you get to pick, pick that, that gives you the flexibility of how you want to distribute those taxes mm -hmm. among the taxpayers in the thing, as long as you don't change the subject of taxation. You can't charge businesses more for real estate tax than you charge a resident. You can't. You can't tax, other than LST, you can't tax the residents outside the city for whatever. But you could change the mix of, you know, more real estate taxes versus less EIT or more EIT, which is, you know, comes out of, out of your paycheck every week versus, you know, one big hit in uh, February or March, right? So. So, just, I'm sorry, one other okay. question. There's so the payroll preparation tax is if, did I understand it correctly that that is a pl that that is assessed to wh when that's available that's assessed on to the business correct to the employer it's a tax on so, the so, so it's, it's basically a workaround to I, I, that's maybe not the right word to use it's a way to tax them for their business operations which includes in exchange which which may not be limited to employing people that live in the city. Yes, and it's a, it was an exchange for a tax on the gross revenue of a business. And when you have a business, in when that law was started 60 some years ago, the, under 1965 Local uh, Enabling Tax Act, the concept of gross revenue 
would translate to gross profit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, nowadays, the larger you are doesn't mean the more profitable you are. So, a more uh, equitable scheme was developed in Pittsburgh where the size of your payroll would have some indication as to your size of your um, profitability because you can't, you know, you clearly if you're paying more, you're bringing in, you have a problem. Uh, so it's more representative of just gross sales being a thing. And the exchange was rather than charging the car dealer a 1% or whatever, one mil tax on the sale of a car for $30,000 of which the dealer might make 1500 or 2000 the idea was to charge a tax on the payroll, the gross payroll, and that was the exchange. And okay. Patty's right, the legislature likes to exchange taxes, yep. not create wholly new taxes. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Rufi, had a question or a comment? Yeah, I mean, this, gets, this is way getting ahead of ourselves. Absolutely. I just want everyone to understand that. Absolutely. But, um, earned income tax. Uniformity clause mm -hmm. that the state says means that we cannot make that a progressive tax. Is that right. accurate? Can we say um, if the income is X, you don't have to pay it, or you pay less, mm -hmm. or does it? Do you understand? What I have been thinking about assumption? this as well, and I I, I, I thought that it is possible to do tax reimbursement schemes where the, the level of taxation is, is uniform, but if you are under a certain income, we basically give the money back to you. And then I think Philadelphia has something along those lines. The LST has that. And the LST has provisions. Uh, there's an income threshold. Okay, so not to get us in the weeds, what I would just say is, if we get, when we, if we get to that point, you all would help us understand yes. mm -hmm. these different aspects of how the Absolutely. taxes are going to hit. The other thing is, you would also help us understand, for example, Sally makes this much money, Joey makes this much money, these people have this kind of property that these people rent, and this is how these folks would be impacted if we change the levers of the taxation in the city. Can, you would be able to help us understand, tell those kinds of stories so that we can help educate our citizens. I was way ahead of ourselves. I'm just like... Yeah, um, the, but the, char the charter doesn't serve as a taxing or a, a taxing document. The no, no, not a chart, not the charter. Oh, I'm sorry, but the or, you know the format of, a, a, of how you enact the tax would be under the charter, the process right. that the city uh, requires itself to follow before a tax is. Uh, for example, under Act 511, if you want to, if the city now wants to change the rate of the tax, they have to advertise three weeks, three separate times, in three separate weeks, that they're going to do this before they even uh, can, can start the process to do it. Because that's uh, assumed you have sufficient public notice. You just can't sneak a tax in at the end of the year. Okay. So those are the kind of process controls that are, that are yeah. Okay. It's good government in a sense. It's, it's transparent. People understand how the government is funded and, and the safeguards so that the government doesn't use that power. Okay. And is that local government or state government that mandates that? Three weeks. Oh, that's, that's state, state government. That's, okay. state, yeah. that's, that's in so the Title 11 legislation. So our charter could make it a higher bar. Yeah. We could say you have to do more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I add to that conversation? The, the charter can also specify guardrails for how much any future city council could raise taxes in any given year or over a series of years mm -hmm. and could peg that to a growth of no more than X percent in the budget. So for example, our collective bargaining agreements raise salaries at an average of 3% each year. If you're a fireman, a police officer, a, a member of the ASME union, roughly 3%. You could peg that uh, and tie it so that there are limitations to how much revenue can be generated in any particular year in association with cost, such that the budget doesn't dramatically increase by 7, 10, you know, some kind of double digit number. And that, that forces 
It creates an accountability to force uh, continued careful spending within city government. So there are really clear and specific things that can be included in the charter that make the lane narrow. And there are a lot of very important reasons to do that because this is not a run to go pull the lever and tax a lot of people a lot more money. This is to keep services running in the city of Lancaster. Thanks. Thank you. Other comments? I will uh, make a comment on um, Representative Izzy's number six. He's talked about the legislation for uh, the legislation that uh, went through the Commonwealth about the municipalities hiring firms for management. And while it's not recommended for a third class city, is that something we would be able to say it doesn't happen? in the charter that we're not looking to do that? I mean, because it doesn't say it can't happen. I you need me to be uh, word that? Yeah, we were talking. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I, I, I asked the person I first. I apologize. Ms. Bird, I didn't realize you were talking, so I apologize. Okay, we was talking about Representative Izzy on his question, on the question number six about the proposed legislation that is in, I guess, at the Commonwealth now about hiring um, management firms for municipalities, mm -hmm. while it's not recommended for a third class city, is there anything stopping that from happening or is that something we could include in the charter to say that's something we would not do? Reverend Cameron, you had a comment? Well, I was going to, if, if PEL didn't hear the answer, I was going to oh, help you would, answer. Okay. The legacy solicitor answer. Okay. <laughs> the answer to that is exactly what your charter is choosing to do. Mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, the options of government are many, but for example, there are governments that have a council and a, and a manager or a management company. You can be prohibiting that through your charter by saying this is how we're going to operate. Mm -hmm. You could say we're going to continue with an elected mayor who's going to be the administrator and a council. You could elect other options, but that's what your charter does is set that, that as the way you're right. going to do it. Sure, and then of course, if that was ultimately going to change, if it's part of your charter, then it's got to go through this process, right? right? Again, later to change it, it's an amendment okay. to the charter, which essentially follows the same process. Right. So all amendments would have to go through this process. Basically, if we would uh, elect to uh, say yes, we want to do a charter, and it goes through the vote, and the people elect it, if there's changes that need to happen, it would go through this process again for that charter to be amended. Yes, and there's actually time. It, there's a there's a there's a period of time for which no amendments can be made okay. afterwards, but after that, then amendments can. Be made. Do you know what that period of time? Is? I believe it's five, five years. years. Five years. Oh, that was the list. Yeah. If the charter, charter. Yeah, if the voters approve yeah. the charter, the law requires five years before the form of government can be changed. Uh, tweaks can occur uh, through a different process, but the form of government. Um, Cannot be changed. And how would tweaks um, happen? Happen. Well, tweaks, tweaks referendum. They have to get. Oh, they have to go to the voters. Yeah. Okay. But those, there's, there's different levels, and generally speaking, five years no change because what? you have to give the new government time to transition and work. Hmm. Yeah. To keep in mind that there's a difference between form of government, right. which is the big structure that's in the charter, mm -hmm. and then some of the other things that are in the charter. Okay. So. When we talk about the big structure, the big structure, we're talking about the form. We're talking okay. about do we have a council? Do we have a mayor? Do we have a controller? Do we have a treasurer? How do they all interrelate? Those are the structural items. Mm -hmm. If you elect to move forward with drafting a new charter and the electorate adopts that charter, those things are in place for a minimum of five years. They will not be able to be changed again okay. for five years. Other things that might be in a charter, for example, you might put um, a cap on a uh, earned income tax. So you might in your charter say we're going to cap it at 2.5%. Mm -hmm. That is what I would, I would st that's the type of thing, and I don't know the specific, I'm picking that out just as the type of topic. And again, the tweaks would have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case analysis, mm -hmm. researching in the law, but those sorts of tweaks that don't hit the structure of the government, those can be changed by referendum, okay. but keep in mind referendum is almost an 18 month process. Right. And the referendum is asking the voters to say Correct. yes or no once they've 
something. It goes back to citizen control of their local government, right. as opposed to Harrisburg, uh, as Fred said, Dillon's Law. Yeah, you can do anything you're not prohibited, because the citizens have the ultimate say, not the legislators. <laughs> now. Anyone? More questions, comments? Okay, um, I think we're moving on. Uh, next item on business is last month we agreed to set up uh, some subcommittees, some groups, terminology uh, to interview uh, different municipalities. Uh, Oh, did we miss something? Mayors. Mayors. Oh, yeah. questions for previous mayors. Yes, I'm one, one step ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yes, we, all, we agreed last month to uh, send out a, a short questionnaire for uh, the three uh, current living previous mayors. Uh, and in discussions I had with PEL, they suggested that we extend that also to uh, previous presidents of city council. Uh, so they have uh, drafted a set of questions very similar but a slight bit different for previous city council presidents and for for mayors um, are there any edits changes uh, I realize these went out very very late uh, that's, so I did print them Similar to the questions we've asked all the other. They're similar, they're shorter. I mean, we didn't have as many for yeah. those two offices, Six but they are seven. similar in nature. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we, and people understand that the former city council presidents are Izzy Smith, Waddell, and the current controller? Well, how, already how far back are you going to go? Right. right. Like, that's how far first. back are they alive? <laughs> They're probably, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't I have no idea. go back a long, long way. Uh, tracking it could be some work. Um, and where they're all at, I have, I mean, but council presidents can change every two years. So <laughs> <laughs> just just noting. And sometimes more frequently if there's a change in vacancy. Now, now I'm, I'm assuming, and, and I'll be with you, I'm assuming that if, if there is I mean, currently, President uh, Bake is on. I don't know if there are any. Is anybody on City Council who was previously the president of City Council? Okay, I didn't think so. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, yes, Mr. Feldman. I was just going to say that honestly, I'm okay just receiving answers from the chief executives from the past. There's only three of them that we can speak with, and you know that's okay by me. I, I think that's fine. Okay, that, that's a decision of the commission. Like I said, it was a suggestion by PEL. Yes, Ms. Cooper. Um, I would like to suggest that our questions, so um, PEL, the questions that you've provided, some have, uh, we have like one through seven, for example, for city council presidents, but some of them have two questions within one. I would like to suggest that we have those as 1A, 1B, 1C, because it seems like some of the responses we've gotten already didn't quite answer all of those questions thoroughly. Um, they may have answered question one or question mm -hmm. three within question one. So yeah. that's just a suggestion yep. I'd like to present. That's fine. Yeah. We can do that. We Thank you, Tom. mean by the executive? You mean the mayor. The mayor. The mayor. The yeah, I'm just mayors. looking at this yeah. problem like, oh, how far do we go? You know, yeah. I, I, the truth is that if there's like 20 people, I'm not sure that, you know, every single response we get is going to be as meaningful as the last. And I don't think that necessarily means that the mayor is more important than the house president. I just think that the mayor has more day-to-day -day functioning uh, responsibilities for the city and um, the way that the city operates, which corresponds to what we do. So. Who would the previous mayor be? So we have uh, James Stewart. 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 Uh, Art Morris. Art Morris. Art Morris. Right. Right. Is there, is there any opinion on whether or I mean, not we should pretty, include when was, when, presidents? Uh, what was Stork was the 90s. 90s. Well, she was in the late 80s. She was in the 80s through the early 90s. 88 to 96. And then Morris and then Gray. And then yeah. Morris and then Gray. I didn't live here. So yes. Oh, yeah. 
uh, Morris was before. Was 1980. Was before the storm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, th going back three mayors back to the 80s, that seems pretty. Very comprehensive. Pretty comprehensive yeah. to me. We, we got yeah. we got about well, four decades covered. Now. Yeah, I don't. I don't yeah. Is that yeah. really? I mean, is, are you saying you're you want you're for so that, or do you feel that? Because that that is kind of a lot for us to mm -hmm. to accomplish. And uh, do we, do to, we, do to we add that? presidents on to, to the council? No, to go, no, no, to go. Yeah, to, no, no, to go back to the eighties. You were saying you wanted to go back. I'm going to do that too. Well, I would like to say, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yep. Um, I don't know that it's the, I didn't think of the um, length of time we were going back. I was more so looking from the leadership perspective mm -hmm. of each of them having sat in that role and what the circumstances were at that time, generally speaking. So I wasn't thinking about, mm -hmm. and I don't know that it matters, that <coughs> we want to go back 20, 30, 40 years, I mean, yeah. as opposed to speaking to the person who held that role. Mm -hmm. I'm up for doing just the old. mayors and not doing previous city council. Oh, that's that's my okay. yeah. So I'm just, you know, with a quick, you know, I'm, I'm back to 2006, and with that, I'm not sure this is totally perfect, but it seems like it, I'm finding three council presidents, John Grappara, Louise Williams, and um, that might be it. So, I mean, I, and I'm back to... That, that's I mean. Yeah, so if, 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 I'm not. I'm, I again. I was just sort of doing a quick scan on my phone, but you know, it may not be as many people as we think, or, that, or we may be able to just selectively, you know, reach out. That's that's a commission choice. Yes. Um, I think we should um, send questions to the three previous mayors. I don't know how important it is for the city council president. I would be more interested in what our city council that is sitting now to be able to ask them questions as far as how they feel government is working. We have a lot of young people on council now, so I would really like to hear their opinion. I don't know that we have to go back to all the presidents of city council. I don't know where, I just don't see why well, that would I would say the same that. thing. I don't, I don't see the benefit in doing that. Um, I would agree with that as well. So am I, I'm hearing that with the, you said, okay, Mr. Dash. I got a maybe potential compromise. I think um, if we do ask any of the council presidents from the past, they should be from the eras of the mayors we were asking, and maybe no more than two, like limit how many. Because I do think their input, especially at certain periods of time where uh, there have been differences of opinion between uh, executive and legislative functions of government, I think that could be beneficial for us in looking at form of government. So if you're going back to uh, Mayor Morris, yeah, you're, I'm not, you're then going back to council presidents from 40 years ago. Right. No, I, I understand Who, that. Not, none of whom were on Mr. McGrath's list. Yeah, I didn't get that far back. <laughs> <laughs> none so. of whom you know. Totally. That's right. Right. No. <laughs> yeah. Tell me more than any of them. Mr. Chair. Yes. yes. I'd like to make a motion that we restrict our. Uh, correspondence to the uh, three former mayors. Okay, there's a motion that we only send questions out to the three former mayors. Uh, is there a second? A second. There is, there is multiple <laughs> seconds. Uh, <laughs> discussion. Is there discussion? Would we in additional the discussion? Current city council? Or that's the, motion, the motion is strictly to not, not send them out to city council, previous city council no, presidents. No, we're talking about current city council. No. That, that, that would be a separate, mayor. that, that becomes a separate right issue. Now. Okay. Um, about the mayors right now. Just the mayors. Any other discussion? Vote. I think uh, we should look into, I'm not saying we should, does, the, does this, if approved, would this close the door on looking into further what council presidents exist? No, this is, just about, the this, this is yeah. just about this is just about this mayor. is strictly about we have a set of questions and uh, which I would be sending out probably on Monday. We're trying to get them out on Monday, okay. uh, and who who do we send them to? Because I would be interested in having a conversation at the next meeting about targeting specific uh, former presidents if they're available to us. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. yeah. Other discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair, we have called a question. Uh, question's been called. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a voice vote, it's fine. All in favor of the motion to only send questions out to the previous three mayors, say aye. 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 All opposed? 
Hearing no opposition, the motion passes. Uh, so we will send those questions out. The only changes were Ms. Cooks to, to break down uh, multiple questions into parts A and B. Are there any changes, other other changes that anybody would like to make to the specific mayor questions? Do we, if we have those, we can send those to you via email? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just make sure we get it before, before Monday, because I, I hope you get it at the beginning of the week. Yep. All right. Uh, let's move on to, let me find my agenda again. This time, hopefully, in the right, the right spot. Uh, home rule municipality visits. Um, we had decided last month that we would set up groups of two or three uh, to interview uh, local municipal leaders from uh, several different. Uh, and working with PEL over the last month, we came up and with input from from the commission, a list of list of uh, municipalities that we thought would be reasonable and desirable, what people would want to, uh, with a few preferences put, tried to put in. So what I did, again, along with PEL, is uh, each of you got this list, which we will then put on online. Anything we have in here will be made public after, after the meeting. Uh, so a, a list of seven, seven municipalities with potential groups, uh, two commissioners. The ex officio was kind of decided that between the vice chair and myself, we would also be a part of each one. Um, like I said, I don't know how much time people have had to look through these. If, if they would want to change, if they don't want to be on one, uh, that would be something we can handle. Uh, it is possible that we could include a third pe person if there was one that you really want to be part of. Um, the, the idea with two was first not, not to try to force an overwhelming presence on, on somebody uh, from Hazleton or Reading, uh, but having more of just a more informal discussion. Um, but we could go to, could go to three if, if somebody would want to. Uh, that, that's the first reason. The second reason is just a matter of the workload on each of us. Uh, if you start putting on multiple ones, scheduling and everything else. When, so, when yes. would we have to have um, these interviews and reports done by the December 1st meeting? Um, the idea would be that we would be, each group would have, would be expected to present their findings <coughs> to the commission. So whether that would be in December or January. That'd be okay. up, up to the groups. So I'm not saying it would have to be done in 10 days. That would be, as, as, as at least I have learned, and hopefully the rest, rest of it we've all learned, uh, anytime you want something done immediately, that takes six weeks longer. So, <laughs> yes, Mr. Uh, did I, am I remembering your, your introduction to this? To, is, the idea would be that these would be Zoom. Yeah, or, that, or, or that, we, we wouldn't be traveling there. They, we wouldn't be asking them to travel here. We'll do this. We'll do this virtually, right? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, and so with the permission much. of the participants, we could also record those and make those available to each other. Uh, that that would be between. That would be up to them whether they could say that they agree to that or not. But yeah, right. I, I would think that would. If be they would, good. if they would, we would. That you, you would do. You, that. that sounds good to you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good. This rough. Then. Go ahead, Tony. Oh, I was going to say, could this be a potential area where we may, I, uh, I know we talked about interns, could this be a area where we look at using interns to assist us in like note taking in these conversations? I, I feel like just I it would record. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to the solicitor. Is there any legality to effectively asking someone to help us out? Um, we have no list. First of all, we have no list of interns. We have no right. possible. Uh, going out and saying we would like to get people to come in and help college students or, or high school students, I personally think would slow the process down. Um, but if there's somebody who said, well, I would like to have, I know somebody and they would like to assist, uh, I don't know, is that allowed? Is, would it be a problem? There's, there's nothing legally that stops you from doing the work the way you want to do it. Okay. Um, you know, you can play devil's advocate the mayor loves me when I use that language, but I'm using it because she's not here to tell me I can't. Uh, uh, you, can, you can have, there, there, there are reasons to and not to do that. Um, again, you mentioned, for example, overwhelming somebody with who's present. Um, 
if the note taker isn't accurate, um, how are you dealing with that? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're doing an informal meeting and it's two of you with one or two people, um, my general thought is A, they'll probably agree to have it recorded, um, and B, you're going to have the questions in front of you that you're asking. Um, what's most important is for each of you to have your own notes of what you understood to be said, because that's really what the purpose is, versus versus somebody taking notes of what's said and passing those on. Sure. Um, so those are just pros and cons, but no, there's nothing legal. Okay. Mr. Mr. Fountain, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, will you, um, PEL, will you draft um, uniform questions that we all of us ask of each of these? Entities. Yeah, I think we actually mentioned that last month. That oh, yeah, right. we, no, that's fine. Or maybe he, maybe we discussed it. We planned previously. It wasn't. We planned to give you a description of the like a like a quick study guide of the municipalities. Oh, perfect. Um, uh, you know, in the home rules, we'll we'll pull the language for the governing body for the the the, the, the option the the, the the third class city uh, examples. We'll pull that stuff. Uh, try to give you an idea of what. Uh, what the form is, so you have that on there, and then um, there's nothing to keep you from using the questions from the mayors that we use now. Just keep everything comparable, um, and we'll be helpful. We will be happy to sit in on all your meetings, uh, your Zoom calls. Uh, however, you know we can offer the staff support for that. Because okay. I, I think it does have to get done relatively quickly, as the Chairman said, um, and this would be an opportunity to work outside of the public meeting and uh, work with the schedules that these other people. The other municipality, and even I'd suggest asking the mayor of Lancaster to provide you with a welcoming letter, you know, a letter of introduction to these mayors, uh, so that there's there's a little bit more uh, reason to talk to you. Sometimes uh, other cities you get shuttled to other people, you know. But if you go right to the to the chief executives, you might get. So we can ask for you. Yeah. Okay. And then um, okay. go ahead. Carl. Okay, uh, and you'll facilitate who we can uh, contact there. Obviously, the mayor, like for example, well, okay, your choice. Uh, I got I got Harrisburg mayor here, but like you, uh, you you'll give us the email or whatever, and then from there, sure. we can yeah, contact yeah, contact yeah. Okay, yeah. and, and yeah. I guess that that's good. Yeah, <laughs> the questions may um, vary. Are we using the city? Like, um, do our computers have the team or something yeah. or Zoom? Yeah. You, have, you have Office 365. Yeah. Yeah. Is that Teams? Yeah, it's Teams. Not Microsoft Teams. Not Zoom, okay. it's Teams. Okay. And if you need assistance with um, any anybody helping you with Teams, to, we can certainly set you up with as well as some of our IT staff to, to help you out. Or 7th grade kid. Uh, more likely it'd be better to get a 7th grade kid. <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> Okay. Although David would argue with me. Yes. You know. <laughs> um, I was just concerned about the time. We're saying December to January, and I think our last meeting is January, and we're oh, going to be making a I think a we're saying between now and... Oh, the, the idea is to have oh. presentations in December and January, that we should have all the, the interviews done between in during November, or you know, possibly, since each of them are doing two, possibly a second one. So hopefully at least the first ones would be done before the next meeting. And if anybody wanted to join any of the other ones, you said they could. Uh, my them. thought is that if we, we could potentially add a third person, we could not add a fourth person. Um, again, I don't, uh, the legality of, if we're setting it up with effectively right now, we have three people for each one. Mm -hmm. okay. Once you, you set four, for if, like if either you or Ms. Rufo are also appearing in your ex officio capacities, yeah, exactly. then you actually have a quorum yeah. of your yeah, and that was that uh, was that that it required to be publicly advertised yeah. uh, and held as a public meeting. And that that's why I, I was thinking we would we would limit to other than uh, the vice chair and myself whether that we could have up to three. Two just seemed to be a more workable number. Uh, and and again, as as I said before, it spreads spreads the workload around. Um, and I should say it's a potential issue um, that would require. I mean, it's not an automatic guarantee that it's a Sunshine Act issue. Right. Um, it would depend on 
how the conversation went as to what it would be. So the recommendation is not to put yourself in that position. Okay. Okay. So you get below the number where that right. could be a question. Yeah. And um, Mr. Chair, are we being, are, you, are we, whomever is on these groups, um, they're providing a written report? Uh, they, I, my thought would be that they would just, they would report to the commission. If they wanted to write a written report, that would be great. It would be public. If they wanted to make an oral report, uh, it would be recorded and effectively the same thing, just an alternative media. Uh, I don't think I, there is a, a, a if there is a, a choice that the commission would prefer one over the other, uh, that, I, that's up to the commissioners to decide. I would prefer written, just because then it's uh, publicly accessible beyond just a meeting with an oral report. But I, that's, 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 that's I mean, that's acceptable to me, is the, that we would agree that we would, uh, each group would write a written report up on, on their responses. Okay, so it's a written report. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Burton. Is there um, any opportunity for people to go and visit any of these locations? Visit personally? Yes. Um, I, it, it, I don't know if there is, I, I, well, as I, I think I've said this in the past, there is nothing to restrict anybody from going out and doing anything they want to. If if one of us would like to say, well, I just want to go up to Reading and I'm, I'm going to go and you know call them and talk to them, you, you may I'm do not that. Asking that. I'm asking that. No, asking but um, as for, I think we've agreed that in order just for a coordination effort that the groups would do Zoom meetings. Um, or teams. Yeah, wow. I mean, I would say I, I kind of use them interchangeably. I would say if you and your group decide you want to go in person, you go in person. If if you can do it, um, keep in mind there is no no funding funding for that. Uh, so you, you would be supporting yourself, but I I would I, I agree with Ms. Rova. I I'd say there's nothing to exclude you from doing that. Can we get an update on our budget for the commission? What sort of update are you looking for? Well, well, I think we were just saying there's no funding for us to go. And I remember when we first sat and talked, one of the issues was going to be we were going to go to other municipalities and find out what they were going to do. And I think when we talked about even hiring interns or whatever, it was like... Well, there's yeah. funds in your budget, but it's up to you folks to determine oh. how to use them. We have to decide, figure out what. So that's why I said enough yeah. enough So if you yeah, have to I, make that decision, we'll be able to yeah. say, well, "Oh I'll no, we can't do that." It's going to cost us much, you know. Just the reason we're here, can't get more to spend if we can't. But if we know what we got, and if people want to go, I will. I will look into it. Okay. See what we might, may or may not be able to do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, the one thing I yes. would suggest is that you're going to have written reports that each individual. Uh, give their own report, not as a group. If you do it where the group is submitting a group report, that group will potentially have become a committee. And now in order to get something approved, that committee will have to be taking deliberations and acting. So you're going individually in pairs to talk with people, take your notes, submit your report, that's your individual views, and what you've done is made sure that we have no potential claims for Sunshine Act. But we could have one document for each city, for the municipality, and each, each person has their report in that one document. Yeah, how you structurally yeah. create it is fine. My concern is if a group, say, you and Mr. Adams are reporting back on your meeting with Hazleton, how did you come to the agreement on the language, the interpretation of what you heard? That's what okay. we want to try and do. Okay. Mr. Chair, can we get questions from PEO? Uh, well, study guides. Uh, study, study, the time frame on, on study guides and contact lists. Yeah, next week. I mean, you have a lot of what you need mm -hmm. for the third class cities uh, in the study guide we gave you. Uh, what we were doing was taking the charters of Allentown and Reading and, and, and pulling out how their structure is. You don't have to create the whole charter, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, that's by this time next week. Okay, thank you. Are there any any? Does anybody want to make changes? Where are you doing that? Letting it be an open idea, but uh, 
somebody said, no, I absolutely can't stand this town. You know, I, you know, I, I have an ex there or something, and I don't want you to You gave us the opportunity to I'm tell you which we could, where yeah. we wanted to go and where we didn't want and, to go. And, and so that was it. Okay, yep. wait, great. Um, anything else to be added with that? Um, on their other business, yeah. Yeah, well, that's the last item, next item. So moving on to other business. Uh, Mr. Dastro, you had. Yeah, I, I actually just wanted to apologize to you guys and to the public because I actually uh, had a misunderstanding at our last meeting. So I now know that it is the job of the fire union president and like the police union president to speak on behalf of the members of the union. So only elected members of the union can speak on behalf of the union. Um, that being said, I still hope we get something in writing from uh, union leaders, and I think it's worth considering maybe preparing questions for union leaders of uh, city unions. I don't know how many there are, but I think it's worthwhile to consider. So that way there's some consistency as well. Is that something that the commission thinks we should should do, should not do? Uh, we had sent questions to the the uh, chief of police and the chief of the fire, uh, the chiefs of fire and police, and so the question comes up is should we be sending them to the, the union rep as well? I think I think we said last time they're welcome to come to any of our meetings and say whatever they like. Right, they are welcome to come, but I think it's worthwhile to prepare some questions so there's some consistency and we guide them in the process instead of them just coming to the meeting and then not really knowing what to speak to or what to speak on. Tony, what, um, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, what, no, um, what is it that we want from the unions that would be of benefit to us that you think? So something I did, like one specific charter I've uh, learned of is that like, the Newcastle PA has a specific section on civil service in their charter. Uh, so if these, from the employee perspective, if they feel there's something we should consider in our charter, I think it's worth hearing about that. Doesn't the third class city code have a civil service? It does. It does. Mm -hmm. but, you, but you're also getting to the design of a charter, which is not where you are. You haven't decided to write a charter, so input on what the charter would govern and not govern would come in phase two if you decide to write a charter. So right now you've limited to department heads because you're trying to understand the function of the current structure of government. Uh, em employees are assumed to always be there and employees are governed by collective bargaining law. Uh, so you, you, that structure is, that's part of the structure you're working under. Uh, you need to know that you probably can't change the collective bargaining structure of, of Act 111 or 195, the Uniform Acts for Public Employees. And that's also part of the structure you're learning about now. But any potential options for you are phase two, if we go that way. Would this be something that if if we decide to move yeah. forward, we should extend out to into the spring? I mean, I, I think so. I just don't want to discount them um, mm -hmm. in the process because unions exist for a reason. So I think hearing those different perspectives okay. within is worthwhile. Any other? So I'm assuming that we'll, we'll keep that keep that on the on the item list for put a pin in it. Put a pin in it. There we go. Any other items for other Yeah, business? I mean, that sort of goes along the lines of where I had been thinking that we would be doing a survey to citizens now, um, but I've been reading a lot more in the last week, and I've communicated with you guys independently, and so I, could you explain a little bit about when other home rule commissions typically um, do something like a public survey or focus groups or something we've talked about that I introduced information about in September, mini publics, deliberative forums. When, when do home rule commissions typically in, engage in that with the public at that level and why at that point in time? I, I don't know the typical types. The ones, the, the government study commissions that I've been involved in, uh, in the past have not used that, the survey mechanisms. They relied on public participation at their meetings and that was always pretty robust when, when, when they were looking at charters, citizens came to, to observe. Um, recently though, uh, I've seen it in the study phase, as you're in now, but 
I have problems with that because the, the questions are being asked of the public in a study phase when the commissioners themselves are learning. So you, you're, you're asking, you're, you're the public, okay? And, and you're representing a group of the public elected by citizens to represent them. To me, you are, your opinion is what counts right now and your understanding of the study. So right now, asking a, asking a question of a citizen in, in a citizen survey about their experience with effectiveness of government or efficiency of the structures, that's assuming a lot of knowledge, that they can answer that outside of, I went to City Hall and it took me 15 minutes to get a permit or it took me an hour to get a permit or something. You know, the concept of, of responsiveness or efficiency and effectiveness is different than what you're looking at. It, 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 you have to learn uh, the structure and you have to learn what you're looking at. In the development phase, if you were to go to do a charter, absolutely it's important to understand what the citizens expect. Because at the end of the day, the citizens are going to vote on it. Uh, and if you have robust citizen participation at your meetings, you're going to get a lot of feedback on your work in real time. But to get a representative sample, I think it's in the design phase. You know, that is when you want to ask, like Newcastle did, how do you feel about uh, executives? You know, uh, who do you feel is, uh, how do you feel if your elected official should be elected? What form? Yeah, those are the questions that they, they they were asking, but they were asking them in a study phase, which which begged the question. Right. You know, they they were they were kind of saying, "Hey, we're going to do a charter anyway, so what do you want?" To, you know, you're not there yet. Yeah. You know. If you ever get there, you may decide not to write a charter. Right. No, I know. That. Right. Okay. okay. Other yeah, yeah, can I ask a question? That maybe I had this on my mind at the beginning, just thinking about the timing of our final, of our of our vote. And then maybe really a little bit to what Amy was just asking, which is, so so when we get to the vote, like just, just to use an earlier part of our discussion as an example, you know, where, you know, we're debating the merits of retaining the elected treasurer. Do, do, are we trying to be clear when we vote that we think, that, that we expect to eliminate that? Yeah, no. Or are we saying, no, no. We're saying that we want to proceed with a with a charter, and then as part of the charter design process is when we evaluate the merits of retaining or eliminating the treasure. Yes, yes. It, it's the latter, Mr. McGrath. So okay. The first yes. part of the statute says you just make the initial determination. Right. Do we believe that we should be drafting a new charter? Right. That is based on. It could be that you. you th it could. One of the reasons could be that you don't think the treasurer is an applicable position. Right. That could be one of the reasons you're doing it. It may be one of many or none of those. Right. Um, the next step then is after you take that vote, and the way uh, PEL has asked you to do it is to take that vote in January to make sure that prior, sometime in January, prior to February when the actual deadline is, if you have elected then to proceed with drafting a charter, then deliberations and considerations about do we want to have a charter that eliminates the treasurer, for example. That unfolds. That unfolds over the next nine months. Okay, that's working. great. Thank you. Yeah, that was super helpful. Any other items? Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second that. Any without a, uh, objection? We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who came today. Thank you for your
seventh grader that you're referencing. And I don't even know if it ever got out of the draft. And so that's that's what they're asking. Okay, okay. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. So I will I will follow up on that. that. Tina would not know that, um, but I will go back and look um, to see. I know that there were some there were drafts, uh, but I don't know if that ever that were ever. Thank you.